Blake's. Like, hey, Scoob, did you hear Nikki Blake is hosting a Scooby-Doo panel? No. Yeah. Like on today's Scooby-Doo episode, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy meet Nikki Blake. Yeah, in a Scooby panel. <laughs> like, we need to get this puppy started. Yeah, okay. Nikki Blake, take it away, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Welcome to the Scooby panel. I'm Nikki Blake from ScoobyAddicts.com. I'm joined by Wendy Bridge and Will Davenport, and we are talking to Tristan Cole. She is a background painter on Scooby-Doo, and we all love the backgrounds. The backgrounds yeah. are just amazing. Thanks. So Tristan, it's so great to have you here. We are so excited to talk to you. Thank you for having me. So you've been drawing and painting since you were a kid, and you said it was a part of your life. Do you remember how young you were when you started and did you go to school for art? Well, I remember sitting on my dad's lap and painting with him when I was very young, like five or six years old. And um, you know, we would paint together and he would show me some of his watercolor techniques. He was a fine artist before he got into the business um, in 1980. He was 40 when he got into the business. Before that, he was a fine artist. So I grew up watching him build models and paint backgrounds and I was always around art. And um, when I was like eight years old or so, I used to watch these videos on how to draw cartoons. There was a Disney animator that put out these videos. And that's where I first learned how to draw like 3D, three-dimensionally, trying to like, you know, see shapes and blocks and boxes and things in like a three-dimensional way instead of a 2D way. And I used to keep sketchbooks and try to draw like Disney characters and kind of American characters. And yeah, I mean, I always kind of draw, drew. And um, we had an animation desk in the corner of our living room. And it had, uh, it had a light disc and uh, peg bars and like stocked with paper and animation pencils. And I used to draw little stick figures bouncing around the pages and I would make flip books. And I love to see things move, you know, and um yeah so let's see um I would sneak into my dad's stash of cell vinyl and and try to do background paintings and I would play around with his airbrush because he had a whole setup in the garage he used to freelance in the garage sometimes like at night you know and that's when he would watch he would paint Scooby backgrounds and actually he only worked on two Scoobies I think he did the 13 ghosts and the um and the scrappy one right the rest of them, it was like Smurfs, like tons of Smurfs, which I love, and like Quickie Koala, stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I grew up watching the cartoons and um, and I, I just, I, I realized at a certain point that that was like a job, like you could do that, you know? And that was, it was really interesting to me. Um, and then, uh, I went to a uh, college at our local city college and I took basic art classes like um, human anatomy and life drawing. And I knew that I wanted to be a background painter and nobody really taught that at the time unless you went to like an art school, which we couldn't really afford. So I, um, as soon as I could, I started taking classes at the union and at a school in Sherman Oaks called the Associates in Arts. And those, uh, classes were taught by Disney feature artists and I was getting like the best education you could possibly get. I was learning how to paint um, Lion King grass from Christy Maltese and um, stone texture like Notre Dame, the Hunchback of Notre Dame from uh, Serge Michaels and Michael Kerensky who painted on uh, Beauty and the Beast. Like I was learning from these guys exactly the techniques that I needed to know for background painting. So um, that was really cool. And then, yeah, when I was 20 years old, I got an opportunity to work at Warner Brothers. And instead of finishing my educational career, I decided to go to the school of Warner Brothers <laughs> and started working in the business. That's great. Uh, yeah. Can you walk us through your career? You have worked on a lot of Scooby-Doo over the years yeah <laughs> um okay so I've worked on a lot of stuff I'm gonna just stick to the Scooby mostly <laughs> the Scooby stuff um so when I was 20 years old I worked on Animaniacs that's when I started as a PA 
and um, was a producer's assistant and uh, started kind of getting to know the ins and outs of animation. And I would paint backgrounds at my desk between, you know, job duties and things. And uh, being around all of those great artists really fueled my passion for wanting to be an artist. And uh, about a couple of years later, well, three years later, there was an art position that opened up as a prop designer. And so I, I jumped on that um, opportunity and that was, I kind of started learning how to draw on Road Rovers, which was after Animaniacs. And then, um, and then Hysteria was my first job as a prop designer artist. And that's where I met Jerry Eisenberg and worked with Scott Geralds. And I think I worked with Scott on Road Rovers too, and I think on Animaniacs, but we weren't directly working together, but yeah. And as uh, he was my supervisor as an artist on Hysteria. I got a computer, I started learning Photoshop, even though everything was traditional, but I used to play around with the computer. After Hysteria, I went over to Disney and worked on a few things, um, Clerks and like Lilo and Stitch. And I was asked to come back to work as a background painter for Scott on Static Shock. And that was like my first background painter job. And it was digital though. So it was actually one of the first digital shows I think that they did at the studio and um I remember like working with David McBride who worked on a lot of Batmans and stuff and he was so pissed that we had to do computer <laughs> <laughs> but uh the the studio was pretty excited about it I think because you know new technology and not having to buy all of those brushes and paints and <laughs> but um let's see so I worked on um, static shock for a couple of years. And then in 2002, my dream to work on first Scooby project came up, um, the legend of the vampire. <laughs> and it was really cool because Ewo was on it and Jerry was on it and, uh, Scott and Joe, a lot of the people I worked with on hysteria and, um, and it was with, uh, you know, the original voices, um, you know, so yeah, it was pretty cool. And, uh, um, the only problem was the schedule and the budget. We had to make it as good as we could, as fast as we could, <laughs> which is in true Hanna-Barbera nature. <laughs> so, um, but uh, it was kind of cool on, on Vampire. I ended up coming up with the colors for the, for the main Vampire. Um, and um, my favorite part to paint on that was the interior groovy trailer at the festival grounds. <laughs> And, um, and the vampire's lair. Um, so then let's see, um, at, right after that, we jumped into the Scooby-Doo Monster of Mexico and, um, and then into the What's New Scooby-Doo series. And that was all pretty much the same crew. And, um, and then 2004, I started working on the Aloha Scooby-Doo with Tim Maltby, Canadian. <laughs> And uh, painted with Trish Bergio, who was a female background painter also. She was from Batman Animated Series and awesome. And, uh, and then we went into the Loch Ness Monster with Joe Sitka. And then um, my highlight for the, the Loch Ness Monster, um, I feel, besides painting, was, um, you know, being at Warner Brothers, we had access to all the Warner label music. And we would get awesome discounts at the Warner Brothers store on the lot. And so we could buy like all the CDs for like three bucks, four bucks, five bucks. And I got the whole fish and the whole Grateful Dead and like all these great Warner label music. And we, you know, as a background painter, you listen to a lot of music. And so um, it came up, Joe was like, I really need some music for this one scene where Del, our character that like drives around in this bus, you know, like what kind of music would he listen to? I'm like, you should try to get some fish. And he got them to let them use the song for it. And that was my idea. So <laughs> I took credit for that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we had a lot of fun painting backgrounds on that one. And then we went into um, Where's My Mummy? And that's when I started uh, working with Eric Simonis, which was one of my heroes from the original, what's, you know, Scooby-Doo. He worked on their very original series. Um, 
and the nicest person ever and the best painter I think I've ever met. I mean, he's amazing with a brush. So uh, after that, I took a little break. Um, I became a mom, <laughs> which was a huge life change. And uh, well, I worked on Crypto the Superdog with Scott uh, for a couple of years. And then um, got to work with my dad on that one and a lot of the Hanna-Barbera alumni. It was really fun. And some uh, Disney feature people. Uh, and, and then I went on to Tom and Jerry, Shiver Me Whiskers, uh, did some Superman Doomsday with Bruce Tim, and then went back on in 2006 to chill out Scooby-Doo with Joe Sitka. And I got to work with uh, Eric Simone is on that one and John Calmet, who's also from the Batman animated series. And then uh, jumped back onto Tom and Jerry Tales uh, with Frank Molieri. Um, that was a Spike and Tony series. And then, um, and then got to do an, a really fun project called Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue with Eric Radomski, which was one of the first times where it was like redesigned, you know, and, and everybody was like, what are you doing? We're just having fun with it. We'll see where it goes, you know? And it actually was pretty fun to work on. Um, simple style and not sure how well received it was, but it was fun to work on with them. <laughs> the scripts were great. Uh, and then uh, and then after that did the Goblin King, Scooby-Doo Goblin King with Joe. And again with Eric Simonez and John Calmet, who of, of Batman animated fame. And, um, and then we did this Samurai Sword with Joe and Eric and John Calmet. And then I took a break and worked on the Secret Saturdays uh, series. I don't know if many people have heard about that one. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, and that was with Scott. And he, he brought over, it was at Porchlight Entertainment. We, he brought over a lot of the Scooby people for that. And, uh, and then I did some Avengers Earth Mightiest Heroes, a couple seasons of that. Um, <laughs> And then I was asked to do, uh, in 2010, this Batman Brave and the Bold episode where uh, there was a Batmite sequence featuring Scooby Gang with Batman and Robin. And they wanted it in like a retro style. And so um, I was really proud of how it turned out. It really, I think it was really fun to do. Um, and Weird Al Yankovic was in that one, I think as well. <laughs> And that was with Bill Dunn. And then uh, in 2011, um, I went over to Wild Brain and worked on the Ricky Gervais show, which was uh, interesting because we did background design and paint. So they kind of eliminated one of the, you know, they just kind of combined them. And that was really super fun. Uh, and then I came back and I did the Tom and Jerry Robin Hood and his Merry Mouse. Um, and that was a Spike and Tony uh, produced with some of the painters were Mike Humphreys and Donna Prince. It was a beautifully done um, directed video. And then in 2012, uh, did the Scooby-Doo Haunted Holiday. So I did a series of videos with Eric Simonez as the art director, Vic Cook was the producer. And um, it was the Haunted Holidays, Mask of the Blue Falcon, Spooky Scarecrow and Mecca Menace. And the cool thing about those videos was Eric had them traditionally painted in a grayscale, black and white. He had like Leonard Robledo and, um, you know, Dennis Jarrell, they then Trish Bergio, they painted these in the original Scooby style. And then I, they gave them to me to infuse color into the, in the computer to give, so they had the original painted look that you can't really get with a computer, but then like, you know, colored, vibrantly like you can with a computer um and that was a that was a really interesting uh way to go and i really liked the way that turned out and then um again i took a break from scooby after that in 2013 uh worked on the tom and jerry lost dragon with uh, that was a spike and tony one and then i went over to uh paramount to work on the spongebob movie um out of water and that was really cool because traditionally painted backgrounds and then we scanned them in the computer and we finished them 
but we started them in, you know, traditionally. So that gives it that look, right? That like painted look. And that gave me such, you know, uh, respect for SpongeBob. I mean, I always loved SpongeBob, I was a big fan, but the fact that they traditionally paint the backgrounds is like huge. It's like one of the only productions that still does that. And um, let's see, after that, did the Tom and Jerry Spy Quest, um, Johnny Quest one, that was super fun to work on. And uh, then I did some Batman Unlimited, um, Mechs versus Mutants, and Justice League Action Series. And uh, it was really like a really cartoony version of Superman, Batman. Um, and then I went over to Hasbro to work on Stretch Armstrong with Vic Cook, who I had worked on some of the Scoobies with. And he sent me to Korea. And I got to visit a couple of the animation studios that we used to send our Scooby stuff to. And I didn't really know that when I got there, I looked on their wall and they had all this Scooby stuff. And all this stuff that I worked on, we've been working together for like 10 years and I didn't really like know that we were, we were the same crew. Like these were my extended crew, you know, from across the world. <laughs> it was really neat to see that. And they were working on some Scoobies at the time and we were doing stretch. And then also I visited another studio um, that was animation. And then I, I visited Maven and they were working on, um, they were doing some stretch Armstrong, but they also had worked on Justice League action. So it was kind of neat to see like all these how it worked over there, you know, overseas, how they did it. And, um, and that was all due to Vic Cook. So I, I thank him for that. <laughs> and then I uh, came back and I started working on the Scooby-Doo Gourmet Ghost, which was a little bit different style. It was like much more detailed and um, it was with uh, Kurt Gaeta and um, Richard Kim, Robert Haverlin from the Batman, some of the Batman guys. It was a little bit more of an evolved style. DTV. Um, and then I got on to the Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans uh, movie. And that was really fun to work on. And uh, did the Superman Man of Tomorrow. And then after that, got hired on to the Scooby-Doo and Guess Who? And did two seasons of that. And, uh, and then <laughs> there's a there's a little anime uh, studio called Crunchyroll that did Onyx Equinox, which was a really bizarre and interesting show to work on. Um, and then did some Batman Long Halloween backgrounds. And, uh, and then my boyfriend's dream was always like for me to work on Freak Brothers. And I reached out to the guys over there and I ended up getting a job on Freak Brothers. So I worked on that for um, like five episodes. And that was super fun. And then, uh, and then got hired on to Animaniacs, which is the very first show that I worked on 25 years ago. <laughs> so full circle. And I've been on Animaniacs now for the last three years, three seasons. So still doing post on that. That's pretty much it. I did 15 different Scooby productions and literally thousands of paintings. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, you've had an incredible career. You're, you just yeah, work so <laughs> I have one speed and that's just crank, crank them out. <laughs> and that's that I learned from my dad. Honestly, it's like, that's the Hanna Barbera, you know, I mean, gosh, he used to tell me about their quota, you know, he would say they'd have to do four paintings a day, you know. And then, you know, they'd all hustle to grab the A to G pants, the sky pans and the wall cards and stuff and try to like, just get those, you know, they counted. <laughs> but yeah, I think he said his record was 70 paintings in a week. Wow. Which, yeah, oh some of them were pretty loose. <laughs> <laughs> That's those big brush painters, you know, but it's different in a computer. You can't go that fast. I don't think, it, you know, it takes twice as long to get that painted look in a computer than it does just doing it traditionally. Wow, but 70 yeah. in a week, that's crazy. No, that was insane, I don't even know. Like that must have been just one week. I, I don't think you can keep <laughs> that up, you know, that's crazy. But yeah. he had a family of five to feed, so <laughs> he's motivated. <laughs> What was it like growing up watching cartoons and then getting to work on some of those cartoons in your career? Yeah, it was, it was surreal. Um, 
you know, realizing that somebody makes those and how many people it takes to make those. I mean, um, it was it was rewarding and a dream come true um, to work on some of the shows that I grew up watching, you know. Like Animaniacs, I used to watch when I was a teenager and then I used to see Bobby Page's name on the credits and then I went and I interviewed with Bobby Page. And I was like, oh, you know, what? Like, oh, <laughs> starstruck. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, to actually be a contributor and a brainstormer and a collaborator. Um, and it seemed very intuitive for me, it kind of came naturally. I just, I think I was kind of submerged in it and it didn't really seem like, it just seemed natural and, um, and very dear to my heart to be able to do that. So yeah. <laughs> You got to meet Iwo Takamoto when you were eight years old and then got to work with him on Scooby-Doo later at Warner, Warner Brothers. What was it like meeting him and working with him? So when I first met Iwo, I was a child. I was, I was like eight years old. I used to, my dad would take me and my little sister to Hanna-Barbera with him when he'd have to like pick up freelance or whatever. And he'd give us money to go get some like snacks out of the um candy machine and so <laughs> we'd sometimes get too much candy so he was like okay, we're gonna meet Iwo I want you to like stand by the wall and just watch you know like behave yourself <laughs> don't bounce off the walls um so uh I could sense my father's level of respect for him um he had always talked so highly of Iwo and uh, when I finally met him again at Warner Brothers in my early 20s, I was starstruck and intimidated. <laughs> and um, one day I bumped into him in the hallway and I reintroduced myself and I asked, I told him of the day that I met him and I asked him uh, if he remembered. And, and he looked at me with a smile and he said, I remember. And that really warmed my heart, you know. <laughs> yeah so uh working with him was was um enlightening for sure yeah meeting him was was uh at the time I I didn't know I just felt like the sense of importance you know I didn't really know like that he was responsible for designing Scooby-Doo and all the shows I would work I would I would watch when I was a kid um for a while, I had an office across the hall from his office. And every morning, he would, he would lean on my doorway, the frame of my doorway, and he would sip on his coffee. And, and we would chat about whatever, um, art, animation, stories, philosophy. Um, he was a bit of a gabber. He would talk my ear off. And sometimes I'd be like, uh, I've got a deadline, you know, uh, uh. and he's like, so? And he would keep talking. <laughs> and I just learned to just work through it, you know. <laughs> but sometimes I would get little pieces of like, you know, like, uh, like I would I'd be working on a layout, uh, painting a layout, and I'd be like, this isn't quite right, you know. And he wasn't much of a layout person, but he could show me like, look. He was, he would really, you know, he loved like a curve and like a straight line and a curve, the opposing, you know, straight line and a curve or stressing a curve or just having it kicked off just a bit. Or, I mean, he'd give me these pieces of advice that were just so subtle, but so important. Like um, if you're painting a, a, ha a house and you want it to look haunted, then you don't have the lights on <laughs> automatically if you just paint the windows black, it looks haunted. And that was kind of like the thing from like the beginning of Scooby. And so that was just a, like one of those key pieces of information that I took with me, you know. But working with Iwo was like working with Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> he was like the Yoda of animation. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> what is it like being a woman in the animation industry? So being a woman in the animation industry meant that I had to try harder to prove myself, or so I thought. But really, I guess I was fortunate to be surrounded by men who were supportive and respectful, and I never really felt different. 
you know, I recently had a conversation with my dad about it. I'm like, did you ever see me as like a woman in the industry or different or anything? And he's like, no, I just saw you as like, you know, another artist. And um, I was just one of the artists, I feel. Um, I know not everybody has that experience, but that was my experience. And um, it didn't matter what color, race, size, gender, as long as you loved animation and loved art. Um, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am today without working with the men that I did, honestly. I mean, there weren't that really many women in positions of, you know, uh, leadership, but um, I think that's changing, but also there needs to be this consciousness that goes with it. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I felt like I might've had to take a backseat to a lot of things because I was a woman, you know. Um, I just kept my head down and painted that's all, <laughs> and took everything in. But honestly, I felt accepted. So I didn't really feel different. That's great. You recently released a book called Into the Night about a boy and his dog on a journey into the unknown. Was it difficult to transition going from working on cartoons to writing and illustrating books? And were the boy and the dog based at all on Shaggy and Scooby? <laughs> Well, for my book, it was a natural, I think it was a natural transition um, from working on cartoons to books. <clears throat> the only difference for me was adding the characters. Because with backgrounds, you don't have that point of interest. And so when you're doing a book, it's like, what's the story about? You have to put, you know, uh, it's a little bit more like painting a piece of pitch art for animation or, um, or doing like a poster or a DVD cover. Um, so that's kind of how I related to doing a book. Um, it's a much slower process, the publishing process as well, which surprised me a lot. Um, the characters in my book were based on my son and his dog and their relationship. And I hadn't really thought of it till you asked me that question. And I'm like, maybe I was influenced by Scooby and Shaggy and their relationship, you know, in that story. So... Yeah, but at the time, I, I wasn't really thinking about that, but subliminally, that could have been it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Crypto the Superdog, I don't know. I think I bought my, my white lab, he's a white lab, and I think I bought him right after working on Crypto, so. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's really about their relationship. They're like brothers, and, uh, and my, my dog is kind of like his spirit animal, in a way. <laughs> he's just there for support and unconditional love. <laughs> It's amazing how your kids and your pets can bond so much. Like yeah. my, my son has always just bonded with one of our dogs and just like loves him to death. And Aww. yeah, I love that. Yeah. I think it's important for them to, to have a relationship with an animal, you know, just to appreciate nature and, you know, ground them a little bit and dogs yeah. are just so unconditionally loving. So yeah. yeah. Like Scooby. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any fun stories that you can share with us about working in the animation industry or about the people that you've worked with? Yes, I do. Where is that? Oh, fun story. I have so many fun stories, but I had to narrow it down. <laughs> um, so work was work. You know, we had deadlines to meet. So keeping your head down, working was really important, meeting the deadlines. But lunch times were the time where you could gather with your friends, you know. I, I, I used to work uh, really closely with the Batman guys. I would go to lunch with them, you know, like different crews and hear different stories. And I did have um, a tendency to work through lunch sometimes. And I think that's why like Iwo and Jerry started kind of asking me out to lunch because they're like, no, you gotta, you know, just because they want you to work through lunch and you know what I mean? It's like, take a break. But um, sometimes you would leave your cubicle and you would walk out in the hallway and you would run into famous people like Chuck Jones. I mean, this was like in the early days. I met Chuck Jones, uh, Ruth Buzzy, Mark Hamill, I mean, you know, they'd come to the studio to do voices. They'd walk around, see the artwork. And it was like, you know, it was like, sometimes you just run into people. It was, that was pretty cool. Um, 
and yeah, sometimes I would get asked to go to lunch with Iwo and Jerry and Joe and Scott. And um, that was always fun because you never knew it was going to happen. <laughs> um, we would get noodles a lot. Uh, we had our favorite places. Um, we would go to Japanese food a lot. And Jerry would always make the waitresses laugh. He would speak Japanese. I don't know what he was saying, but uh, they would laugh. And um, if you didn't eat your food fast enough, I was a slow eater. Jerry would like start eating your food. So <laughs> would try to eat faster so that he wouldn't start picking on my plate. Um, and this one day we were, we were coming back from lunch and we were driving down Ventura Boulevard towards Sherman o in Sherman Oaks towards uh, where we were working. And he saw Mr. B's Cadillac parked outside of this Italian restaurant that's closed during the day, but they opened up for him. And so he's like, we're gonna come by, we're gonna surprise him. <laughs> so uh, we parked and we went inside and he was surprised <laughs> and pleasantly. It was just him and his assistant Carlton sitting in this restaurant. It was like the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> and he invited us to his table and you know, I mean, I, I just sat there smiling. I didn't think, I don't think I'd talk much, but they were talking and it was just really neat. Um, um, you know, Jerry was kind of like part of the family. Like they, they went way back. Their history goes way back to Brooklyn. But, um, uh, and then let's see. Uh, later, I got invited. I got invited to go to Mr. B's office to watch Zatoichi episodes. Um, he was really into Zatoichi. Uh, it's a black and white series about a blind swordsman. And... Yeah, so, okay, <laughs> hanging out in Mr. B's office, and I'm looking around, you know, and he's got like this wood paneling on his walls, and he's got this painting with this spotlight on it, and I look closer, and it's my dad's painting, <laughs> and I asked my dad later, I'm like, did you know Mr. B has your painting on the wall? He's like, oh, that must have been the one he bought during my interview. Like he brought in, you know, his like portfolio paintings and Mr. B was like, I want to buy that one. And so he sold it to him and he had it on his wall after all those years. So yeah, that was crazy to see that. Um, but yeah, there was like, there were a lot of good times at the studio. Never knew it was going to happen. And working with those, those guys is something that I, I, I still like, I pinch myself. I'm like, gosh, why was I in animation during that time that, you know what I mean? It's like, it's not like that anymore. It really isn't. And hopefully it'll get back to that at some point. But right now it's just kind of, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Everybody's kind of working in their houses. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some people That's, are going back. Yeah. That's great. That's, I, I love that they accepted you. Yeah. It was, it was about making each other laugh. That's really like, it never got heavy. It was never, it was always like, making each other laugh, um, then whatever we would kind of talk about or giggle about at lunch, they would draw pictures of later. <laughs> you know, that's how a lot of great ideas come up is a lunch on a napkin. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Wendy, you have some questions? Yes. So you've kind of answered a little bit of some of these, so I'm going to tweak them just, just gently. Mm -hmm. um, so your dad is an amazing artist. Ron Rush, background artist, but also a fine artist, really, really great. Um, so I'm curious, did he, uh, you, you mentioned a really great story about working with him when you were little and stuff. Did mm -hmm. he encourage you to pursue a career in art? And how, how, did, how do you think he feels that you essentially followed in his footsteps? Like that's gotta be kind of a, kind of a great thing for him, I would think. Yes, he, he definitely encouraged me. Um... I actually was kind of contemplating being a marine biologist for a little while. You know, I've always had, like, I wanted to save the whales, <laughs> do something to yeah. save the whales. And he's like, I can't really help you with that, but maybe you should take an art class. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to draw, like, you know, on, on envelopes and just like all around the house would be stuff. And he's like, just take an art class. And so I started taking art classes and it just clicked. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about what might have sparked that initial um, interest. And I remember um, 
in, around 1980, I guess it was 1982. Uh, he had been at Hanna-Barbera for a little bit and he was working on Heidi's song um, with Paul Julian and uh, they had a premiere that he took the family to and it was, it was really different for us. We're like, whoa, we're gonna see your work on the big screen. I mean, we're used to seeing it in like art galleries and stuff. And, uh, and seeing his dad's painting, he would be like, I did that one, I did that one, you know? And uh, it was just like, wow. Um, I kind of realized that that might be something I wanna do. That's really neat, you know? And um, yeah, so he definitely encouraged me and, um, and I think I, I think he could tell that I had a little hankering for it anyway. So, but yeah, like working with him was really weird because I thought, oh, cool, I get to work with my dad. We're gonna drive to work every day and we're gonna hang out. <laughs> like, no, no, I wanna like go do my thing at lunch. You go do your thing. And so we didn't <laughs> together. It was like, we just showed up, hi, hi. It was like working together, but not like family. It was funny. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he wanted his freedom. He wanted, he had his thing going, you know, his friends yeah. and stuff. And they had the thing and I was like, oh, okay. He didn't want me tagging along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was on Freakazoid when I started on Jack Hyder's crew. And yeah, I was just like, I was on a different floor. So it didn't really, didn't really see him much, but we were able to work together on a few things. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on what kinds of things you guys collabed on? Yeah. So on Road Rovers, uh, I was a production assistant, um, but he was like a, um, he did development, a lot of really, really cool drawings for that show that they never used, but they kind of, you know, they simplified down. I mean, his drawings are, are like, he paints with a pencil. I mean, he was a painter for a little while. And he transitioned to being a, a background layout artist and pretty much did that for the rest of his career. I mean, he had this way of, before computers, he could draw environments in any, he could turn them and he could do things that like nobody could do. And he would draw these beautiful drawings. That I, I mean, following in his footsteps is like, I couldn't follow in his footsteps. I would have to make my own footsteps, but I was definitely inspired by him. Um, and then, yeah, we worked on Hysteria, but we were on different crews. I think he worked with um, Herb Moore on his crew. Uh, I think he did layouts. And, um, and then we worked on Crypto the Superdog, and he did the layouts, and I painted the background. So that was pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. I got to paint yeah. it. But his backgrounds were a little bit, I don't know. Like, I was just like, Dad, you got to fix this one thing. And he's like, <laughs> get annoyed. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> you know so yeah that's family. that's so cool I'm, I'm glad that you guys got to work together and and not just be in the same building but to actually be able to say you know what we both we both put put our our special touch on this project and I think that's great I, I can oh, just imagine sure. how proud he must be of you and like what a thrill it would be to I mean I don't know I I just imagine that would be a lot of people of parents dreams is that their kids love what they love too and love it enough to become so proficient like you are you know what I mean like kind it's of rare I think because I mean he had five kids and I'm the only one that followed in his footsteps and my kids yeah. don't don't really I don't think they're going in the animation direction and I'm like come on don't you want to no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, that's great yeah it just worked out that way yeah <laughs> so background painting and background design are not the same job Mm -hmm. uh, could you please explain to us the difference and is there ever a time when the background designer gets to paint their own background? Yeah, so background design is black and white. You know, it's basically taking the storyboard and composing the scene uh, to frame the animation. It's setting the stage for the animation. And um, sometimes they'll put a tone on it to kind of indicate the lighting, but the background painter gives it the mood the color, the mood, the texture. I mean, there's a hundred ways you can go with a black and white drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you're in the union, it's like there's the background painter and there's the background designer. And, you know, they're, they're, they're different categories. They're different, you know, 
Um, but when you're working at a non-union studio, sometimes they're like, oh, paint's background, gym drawing, you know, like combine it. So um, yeah, like on uh, the Ricky Gervais show, we just took the storyboards and then we just made our own background layouts and painted them, which was like the first time I've ever really done that. And it was, it was really fun. So it was free, but I could understand why they would want to break that down a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, people who are really good at drawing uh, background layouts, it's kind of a different craft than painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if you can be really good at both. You know, um, I'm a color person. I see color. I'm not really a layout person. You know, I could probably do it. I have done it, but it's not my forte, really. Mm -hmm. And then there's some mm -hmm. people who are like, we can't paint, but I could draw. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind that's of the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So how much creative freedom do you have um, when either if you're doing designing or if you're doing painting of the background? And does the studio usually have a lot of input on what the final design is going to look like? Mm -hmm. Yes, the studio definitely pretty much decides, you know, they, they come up with a look before they, you know, put it, plug everybody in place. They're like, we're gonna make it look like this. Um, so like, you know, when you're given a layout, you do have a lot of freedom as to what you can do with it, but it has to look like the show. Um, you know, like Scooby has, you know, a certain look to it. Batman has a certain look to it. it you know, you can't really deviate from, and you can't really indicate it with a, black and white drawing you just kind of have to like the background painter has to create that environment you know and that feeling and that mood you know um and then yeah definitely the studio is going to tell you whether or not it's yeah they they give you notes <laughs> lots of notes <laughs> <laughs> can't get your feelings hurt when you get notes that's part of the gig right right <laughs> The collaborative process it's like back and forth back and forth you know so it's getting it to that right place and you know making it so that it, the best way to tell the story you know with the mood and everything whatever's going on mm -hmm. but there's usually a color script that you follow and within that color script uh which are little thumbnails you know they're little color thumbnails mm -hmm. that kind of give you the the color scheme and then you can you can have fun within that like how you paint it how you approach it and that's, that's individual. That's what the, each individual painter puts their magic into it that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how difficult is it to coordinate and create a, a cohesive final product when there's multiple background artists sometimes working on the same project and it all has to kind of look like it came from the same person in the end? Like that to me sound it sounds impossible I mean I love cartoons so I see amazing <laughs> artists doing it all of the time but I just I can't even my my brain can't even begin to understand how that works <laughs> well it's a vocabulary it's it's like a vocabulary for each show so um you would have like this is kind of the brushes that we use the textures that we use you know there's usually a bible that kind of like breaks down how to paint the backgrounds because not only do you have to translate between painters in a studio but the painters overseas or the animation studio needs to be able to paint that too so you can't make it too crazy you know it's, you have to kind of keep in mind like the deadline but the, the budget you know how much time do we have to do these and you know how much work is it going to be and then what's the best way to break it down so that anyone can paint it yeah, so it's a vocabulary you have to come up with in the beginning, and um, you know it takes some work to get it there. But that's that's how to get that look um, cohesive throughout. Yeah, yeah, like um, we had you know a set of brushes that looked like paint brushes for Scooby. Um, you know, on Stretch Armstrong, we had these tiled brushes that gave it a reflective look. You know, so basically just by painting with these sets of brushes, you're getting in the ballpark and it's kind of up to the painter to just come up with like the colors, you know, and like get it there. But then these brushes kind of help it tie it together. Yeah. Yeah. That's really neat. Yeah. You got to have the rules in place. Mm -hmm. The line mm -hmm. weight, 
you know, just whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. So especially with your dad being a fine artist, as well as like working in animation, um, I would imagine that you have been exposed to a ton of great art and great artists in your life. So what artists have inspired you in your work? Yeah, um, I was pretty much inspired by um, like animation artists. He was inspired by Andrew Wyeth. I think that was his big, like, you know, like as a painter. Um, for me, Mary Blair, Walt Paragoy, uh, I studied Ivan Earl, Paul Julian, um, Maurice Noble. Those were my favorites. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So traditional versus digital. It's always a question that we like to ask when we have artists on. Um, so I, I'm interested in your opinion. I've got kind of a sense of it from things that you've said tonight, um, but what is your opinion on which is maybe better if, if you think it's either, but I'd also love to know if you think that a hybrid between traditional and digital might be better than just digital I mean, I think that eventually digital is just going to completely do away with traditional. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a hybrid of like the best parts of the traditional and the best parts of the digital, like we should be striving to keep a little bit of both rather than just going straight from one to the other and one is no longer relevant? Well, I think that, um, you know, the computer is a tool. It definitely helps with animation. Like say you paint a traditional background in day colors and this, something happens, the script changes or storyboard changes and you're like, oh, it needs to be sunset or oh, it needs to be night. So then you gotta go back and paint it. Well, on the computer, it's really easy to fix. You know, um, you can put effects and you can saturate the colors a lot more with the computer. But there's a lot that like painting traditionally really, I don't know, that organic feel, you know, that, that hand um, feel, it's just different. Uh, it kind of just depends on what they want the end result to be. Like if you start a traditional, if you start a painting traditionally and then you finish it in the computer, then you don't really have like, the finished piece is a computer piece, you know? Mm -hmm. So unless you finish it traditionally, you're not like holding a painting up. It's like, it's finished in the computer. And that's, you know, that's, so that's that hybrid, that combination. Um, I like the idea of actually having paintings, you know? like like cells and paintings you know it's just I, I but it is a clunky art form compared to what we can do with the computer today uh, mm -hmm. I really don't like the AI stuff like oh please don't <laughs> don't go there <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> yeah I, I definitely am a fan of the hybrid um model I think uh but the technology is getting better the brushes are getting better. I mean, I remember in the beginning of Photoshop, like it was really hard to find good brushes. And now there's like great brushes that give you that painted look, but it's yeah. still digital. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's so important to keep your chops. Like I still paint and draw traditionally on a regular basis. You know, I do figure drawing and I do painting and just like I play around just to keep that hands, you know, that tactile feeling. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. But you know, I, I, I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't do a, a traditional, a traditionally painted show. It just mm -hmm. depends on uh, what, what, you know, what the project is. Mm -hmm. But animation, I think the reason why we do animation is to be creative and to like have those like abstract and, and funky, like happy accidents and things that, you, you know. So I'd like to see a lot more of that. Yeah. Yeah, animation, like creative animation, you know, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. like, uh, just animate as you think, like just, you know, instead of having it all boarded out, right. have sequences mm -hmm. that are just really like kind of go out there and come back. And I love that. that. Those are some of my favorite sequences and the most creative parts, you know, you don't see it too much. <laughs> yeah. Unless yeah. it's a real artsy thing, but. <laughs> in a previous interview that you did you mentioned getting to work with Iwo Takamoto uh, Jerry Eisenberg Scott Geralds 
And you said that you guys would have drawing wars. Oh, yeah. Uh, that sounds amazing. And could you please tell us a little bit more about this? Well, I was I was looking at some of the drawings. I, was, I found some. I'll share with you guys. Um, but I think Joe Sitko is the meanest, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but okay so okay here's a couple examples okay so we would go to lunch we would just goof around and then or or say you didn't come into work that day and then there'd be like all these things on your desk and you're like what the heck okay so like like this one for instance um like I worked at home one day and I come back and there's this drawing of me from Joe and it's like I don't know it's kind of, <laughs> not the most flattering <laughs> my Tristan takes a work at home day <laughs> and I'm like thanks Joe okay and then like Jerry Jerry was making fun of my he, he was a big opera fan he loved Tristan and Isolde so he would like oh, you know have you ever heard that opera and, you know so he did a drawing of Tristan and Iwo Tristan oh and my Iwo. gosh That's great. and he would like put that on it's just like funny stuff you know or, or even like okay I think this one he did of Iwo. Um, oh my gosh. He got him a pirate out. Fantastic. I don't know. It's just silly, you know, Love just it. like goofing off. <laughs> and he used to draw me like a duck for some reason. Jerry used to draw me like a duck. And it used to make me mad. So he would draw more pictures of me like oh a duck. My God. And I don't know how he got in that trip, but. <laughs> Yeah, and so then from then on, it was like I was always a duck. I don't know even. Oh my that. gosh, it's great. Like Fang Face, but of <laughs> so cute. And then he drew that, like sneaking up on me. I don't know. He's just silly. Just <laughs> like what the heck? Like oh my gosh, I don't know. I'm looking over my cube, like just irritating the hell out of me. <laughs> Trying to get my work done. He's so funny. You know, oh, these are great. And like Joe would draw me. <laughs> <laughs> Girls gone wild. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of drawing wars we would have. I've got a whole stack of these things. <laughs> yeah. That's and then so sometimes cool. Iwo would come around. Iwo would, would correct them if they were. <laughs> 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 he's like you this could be better this could be funnier if you do it this way <laughs> so. yeah that's great good time oh, thank you for sharing those those were wonderful <laughs> <laughs> i thought you would appreciate seeing this we definitely do <laughs> definitely <laughs> So you have had an amazing and very accomplished career. You've worked on so many beloved properties. Is there anything that you haven't gotten to work on yet that you'd love to still do? Uh, like what, what's a dream project for you? Hmm. I mean, something like super creative, like, like maybe just like really artsy abstract. Um, my dream project was really my books. You know, um, mm -hmm. I have a series of seven that I want to do um, and I'd like to see them animated. So that would be a dream of mine. Um, but yeah, something like Iron Giant would be cool. You know, something that's just mm -hmm. really, you know, heartwarming and, and just like uh, a feature. I've done a couple features. Maybe some more features would be cool. Maybe, uh, you know, sometimes I'm kind of like, I want to art direct because I have a lot to like, you know, of ideas. But I, I don't like working that hard. I, I kind of like just be... <laughs> in the production side and just like, I love seeing my stuff on screen. If you're an art director, you don't get to really see your stuff on screen. And um, I'm kind of, I have a little ego about that. Like, I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I like just doing paintings and you know, I'm, I'm really happy with what I've, what I've already accomplished. And um, I, you know, like I said, my, my dad got in the business when he was 40. I'm a little over 40 now I've got 20 years under my belt and I feel like now I'm finally getting it now I you know I just feel like I'm I'm in my prime like I'm really excited for what could come next yeah yeah that's <laughs> awesome well I have no doubt that anything that you put your hand to is going to be incredible so uh we can't wait to see what else you're going to turn out uh you have a long long career ahead of you still to make really awesome stuff for us to enjoy so <laughs> hope so.
<laughs> There's always like so, these kind of career parties that you have after every production. You're like, oh, I'm never going to work again. <laughs> and, you, and you're like, oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say then that your book is, is what you're most proud of out of anything that you've, that you've done? Would it be um, your book? Well, I don't know. This, we'll see. But uh, as far as like things I'm most proud of, I mean, anything that I painted that was spooky, like any spooky forest or haunted house or cave or like, you know, I love painting dark, spooky things. So those are usually the scenes that turn out the best, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's one of my favorite parts of work. I love painting night scenes for Scooby and spooky scenes, yeah. you know, yeah, that makes it fun. I don't like painting daytime stuff. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know just, you can have so much more fun with you know the colors and the shadows and things but yeah yeah well I, there's no question I mean we love Scooby Scooby is, is our thing for sure and I don't I couldn't tell by your background. <laughs> no, you couldn't tell. I know. It's just, it's who, what, what's even here? Nothing's even here. You see, you see nothing. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know that we fully appreciate enough, especially when we're young, how much of the Scooby that we love is not even the character. It's those amazing backgrounds that create oh. this atmosphere that, I mean, you know, a picture of Scooby on a white page is great. We love that too. Mm -hmm. But you put Scooby in that scene of the graveyard or the spooky mansion. And yeah. I mean, come on, that's, that's just amazing. That's true. Yeah. I, it wouldn't yeah. be Scooby without that. No, it definitely <laughs> wouldn't. <laughs> but you know, the backgrounds really aren't supposed to upstage the character. So but I think in some yeah. cases in that show, they maybe don't. they're not supposed to, but yeah. I would, I mean, I, especially <laughs> now that I'm notice. older, <laughs> I kind of think that maybe the backgrounds are the actual stars of, of a lot of animated features and shows. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I kind of try to like make them sing, you know, like, yeah, definitely. Even though they're definitely. in the background, they got to look good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question for you is a fun one. Mm -hmm. Pretend a magic genie grants you a wish. Mm. You're going back to Hanna-Barbera Studios when you were a kid for just one day. You can relive any good memory that you have. What is the memory that you want to relive again? Mm, that's, I mean, just walking through that uh, background painting department, um, it's, it's unlike anything that I've ever witnessed in an other animation studio. It was a big open room with art tables and everything was like open, you know, yeah. like, you know, with these other animation studios, it's like cubicle, 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 and there's not a lot of collaboration with there. It's just like drawing, painting, you know, and I miss that. No, that is cool. I, gosh, there's so many little like, I mean, memories of Hanna-Barbera when I was just a kid. So, but I, I went to a couple of the Hanna-Barbera picnics, like at Marine Land, that was super fun. and. I, big rock ranch in Malibu and seeing one of my dad's art shows on the bridge between the two uh Hanna Barbera buildings that was like super special so yeah like just going back there I mean it doesn't exist anymore just going back there one day or anything just the smell of it the smell of the paint <laughs> the airbrush you know I mean the rolls of paper it's just it's just a really really cool place so yeah hard to pick one thing <laughs> Yeah, well, that's okay. I, I, I was hoping that you'd pick more than one and just go ahead and elaborate on it anyway. So. <laughs> or like sometime in the 70s. I'm sure it was really fun in the 70s. Yeah, that, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Will, you have some questions? I do have some questions. Um, uh, but first, I just wanted to say this is awesome. It's really great to listen to your your stories and just learn about what's going on behind the scenes and we are here uh primarily to talk about scooby but you work on some of my favorite properties the long halloween uh teen oh, yeah. titans versus teen titans go so thank you for working on those um those are oh, all things that i've enjoyed with my daughter we watch a lot of cartoons together oh that's and, so cool yeah not long actually, halloween she, <laughs> yeah yeah no no not yet um, <laughs> she actually likes the tom and jerry features too so uh -huh. I, was, I i hadn't realized you worked on those so that's great oh awesome um, 
In terms of, uh, I'm interested in with Scooby-Doo, how they made some pretty dramatic shifts in the style over mm -hmm. the past couple of series. They went from Mystery Inc. to Be Cool, and then they tried, and then guess who? And um, and you sort of, you've already talked a little bit about this, but do you have any uh, sort of insight as to how the art direction style was chosen for, for guess who? Because it, it was uh, quite a bit different, it, and it was looser. And I, I kept looking at the work there, and I, I had the sense that it feels loose and it feels fast, but I had sort of this thought in my head that I bet it, it actually takes as much time as anything else. It just has that feeling to it, um, mm -hmm. which gives the, the series a certain feel. And I thought it was a nice change from what had preceded it. But do you have any sense as to why uh, they made some of the decisions they did on Guess Who? I think, uh, well, first I have to say, I've never worked on a googly-eyed uh, Scooby, so I'm happy to say that I've never worked on anything. <laughs> the big, <laughs> ah. But, um, <laughs> uh, I think Nadia Mori, who was the original art director on that show, was kind of responsible for this setting that style. Um, it's just like a super colorful, quick graphic style. Um, and so she's probably the reason why. I, I came in on that series a little late. I, I came in after the first couple episodes, so it had already been established. Um, they went through a lot of people on that series. Um, uh, I really like the looseness of it. I, I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of like SketchUp layouts or, you know, like really realistic stuff. Like, I don't think that's Scooby. For me, I feel like Scooby is like a loose, fast, you know, but that was done in a little bit different way because it was very vibrant and uh, it had a little different style to it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think, I think she's the one that that really set that style. And then yeah. she, she did the first season and I think went on to Nickelodeon after that. But um, she, I worked with her on Clerks and, and on Avengers and um, she worked on Iron Giant. She's an amazing painter. Um, so yeah, we were lucky to have her for a little while while she was there. Also Eric, uh, Eric, Eric Martin was another painter that was on that um, series that paints in that style, like that loose style. So I think he helped set the style as well. Oh, and then he left and he went on up. to Solar Opposites like halfway through that, so. Huh. Okay, but I'm gonna check those out. Yeah, for sure. Um, and actually what, my next question kind of ties into what you were just talking about, which is you said that you had worked on the, um, the gourmet ghosts, right? The direct to, which in my mind, and I might be misremembering, but I actually remember feeling like that one was very detailed and had yeah. very. That was then. I think they used SketchUp a lot of for the, a lot of the uh, background layouts. It was very detailed. I had to work on a lot of the library scenes and the books, and yeah. like I was just like, oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was it was very realistic, kind of straighter, more realistic. But it was just another, you know, another way to do it. How much more time uh, would it have taken to work on between the fact that it had a more detailed style, but then also the fact it was a direct to video movie, like sort of like a longer production. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between working on a series and, and one of those um, feature length videos? I, I think that the series, sometimes I think series tend to have a longer production schedule. The, the GTVs kind of go fast, you know, you've only got like a few months on those or, I mean, it kind of depends. Um, but normally, you, it's, it's weird. It's like, in a way, you have a longer time, period of time to flush out the background paintings. So you could really like elaborate on the background paintings a lot more than in a series, especially like Guess Who, every episode took place in a different location. So there was no reuse. Every, every episode you had to repaint the whole thing. It was like fresh and new, different location. You know, nothing was the same. So you had to kind of move fast on that. Um, but like with a DTV or, or a direct to video, you have to, you can, you can, you can spend a little bit more time on the locations um, and really elaborate more. Um, but, you know, I think they break it up and they, they kind of farm out the, the artwork a little bit more on those so that each person can like really take their time. Like I think with 
something that's so detailed like Gourmet Ghost. I think they had a lot of painters on there so we could really spend our time on them. But it, it's up to the producers and how they want to run the show. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is, if you can um, explain this, but uh, is there any length of time that you would say it takes to do one of those more detailed ones compared to something that you might have done for like just the number of hours that you put into those uh i don't know if it's probably varies from like every every piece that you're working on i mean i I'm try to do really like a painting a day but some of those take yeah. like a week to do you know it really? just depends like if it's a you know if it's an establishing shot it can take a long time to get it right you know yeah uh, it just depends on how much detail is in the in the painting you know yeah you've got um if you've got a library full of books it's going to take a lot of time to detail draw you know paint every little thing versus like you know maybe a landscape that doesn't have a lot you know maybe just some trees or something yeah yeah uh, so we um we go back and rewatch these regularly are there any backgrounds that you're particularly proud of or that you think we um we should go back and look at and say oh tristan did that one <laughs> Well, like I said, anything that has like a haunted house or a cave or something spooky, you know. Um, also, like on my uh, on my Instagram page, I have some scoop, some of my favorites. Um, okay. So you it, uh, she Tristan paints a lot on Instagram <laughs> uh, and dig around in there for some. I think there's some from uh, like the Loch Ness monster and you know just some of the different uh, landscapes that I did. But I like I said, like when you watch those, anything that is that you know it looks inspired you know that's like it's definitely inspired like a graveyard or you know a spooky forest or something um so you worked on you worked on crypto and tom and jerry were there as many opportunities i mean i'm sure there weren't as many opportunities but in i actually didn't watch the crypto series but i have this um, did you <laughs> i didn't i didn't watch that one you not, but you is not. it <laughs> Did it, it have a lot of dark backgrounds like that? I always envisioned oh, like no, a Superman inspired no. thing to be like, right. It's all blue skies and metropolis no, no, no. and things like that. That one, okay. So, you know, kind of the difference between Superman and Batman. Crypto is takes place in the Superman world, right? The DC world. So most of Superman is blue skies and metro mm -hmm. metropolis, you know, right city. Um, so that that's what crypto was. It was it was metropolis. And, so was it, it was it as fun day. for you? But when Bat Bat Hound would show up, it would be at night because it <laughs> wouldn't look the same if he showed up in the daytime. <laughs> All right. That's so great. we tried to make it spooky, but it was for preschool kids, so we okay. had to keep it light. Okay, yeah. that's that might have been why I missed it then. <laughs> um, and uh, my last question is: we so we've talked to a lot of animators uh, who worked at Hanna Barbera at different times. And I think you're, you might be the first like background artist that, that we've talked to. And there, I've gotten a real sense of the culture of animators mm -hmm. and the sort of personality that it takes to be someone who does the drawings of the characters over and over again. And uh, just from my personal experience, I would think that's a really different skill set than being a background artist. Are, are there sort of characteristics or like a cultural difference between people who all work on backgrounds versus those people who are just cranking up the, the character drawings? Or does everybody sort of have a similar kind of vibe? You're all just in there working as hard as you can, as fast as you can. Well, I do think there's a little difference. Um, I tend to see the background painters as the artistes, you know, and I tend to see the character, the people who draw characters is more of like the actors, you know, and I think you know, the backgrounds aren't supposed to upstage the characters. So I think in some way, I think background painters tend to not upstage the character people, you know? Mm -hmm. They're quiet and they kind of stay in the background and then, the, you know, <laughs> the character guys are up front on stage. Maybe, that could be, I don't know. But most of the background painters I know are pretty quiet. You know, we, we, we just kind of put on our headphones, plug in and paint for hours. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that's, silly, that's what I figured. We're all artists. We all, you know. So yeah. I mean, like I was hanging out with Ewo and Jerry. I'm a background painter. They're a layout. They're characters, people. But um, 
you know, we got along fine. I don't know, like as far as the workload goes, if it's any different, but they are a little more boisterous, <laughs> flamboyant. I believe it. Um, <laughs> That was my last question. This has been great. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience. It's very Thanks inspiring. And I'm, I'm going to check out your Instagram uh, as soon as we get off. So, oh, right on. <laughs> Thanks, so, you guys. Do, do you watch the shows that you work on with your kids? And what do they think about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're a little older now. Um, they're not as into cartoons, but they do watch Animaniacs with me. But they grew up watching the Scoobies, and you know they loved. They loved. There's certain ones that are scary, like Camp Scare. They didn't like. It was too edgy. But um, the ones that I worked on with uh, with Scott and with Joe, and they they're cartoony. You know, they're they're kind of better for like little kids. And my kids absolutely loved them, and they grew up watching Crypto, and yeah, they like seeing my my name in the credits and seeing the paintings on the, they see me working on them and then they're like it's on tv <laughs> that's great yeah. i do have to give a shout out to scott gerald's because he connected us so that we could do this interview so it's really cool of him and i really appreciate it and <laughs> yeah it's it's been great talking to you you're just amazing your work is amazing we we have always my loved first time doing the stuff like this I'm, I'm not used to like talking about what I do so I was like oh somebody wants to talk to me okay <laughs> Yeah, we we've always loved the backgrounds and and have always said that the backgrounds are just as amazing as the characters. So, yeah, thank you so much for everything that you've put into the shows for us so, so we can enjoy it. I know you guys are watching the backgrounds. I'm going to make them even better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for what you do for Scooby and for keeping the dream alive. Yeah, we we love Scooby. Right <laughs> In on. case you couldn't tell, <laughs> and and Will and Wendy are also artists. They do some oh. really awesome Scooby drawings and other drawings, and Wendy awesome, makes some crazy things. So yeah, yeah, awesome. it's it's great to it's fun. It's just fun to you know just have fun. That was like yeah yeah. If it's yeah. not fun, don't do it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate thank it. You. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Thank and it was really nice meeting you guys. It was nice meeting you, you too. too. It was great to thank meet you, so you too. Thank you so much. All right. Much. I'll be tuning into your future podcast. <laughs> <laughs> much appreciated. All right. Take care, you guys. All right. All right. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to another Scooby panel. I'm Nikki Blake from ScoobyAddicts.com. If you like these panels, please subscribe to my channel for more great discussions. A huge shout out to our patrons, Ross from ScoobyFan.net, Scooby-Doo of Roblox, and Ruth Elliott Hillsden. If you would like to support the Scooby panel, please go to Patreon.com slash ScoobyAddicts. A very special thank you to background painter Tristan Cole, artist and Scooby fan Will Davenport, and artist, blogger, and Scooby collector, Wendy Bridge. Scooby Panel is available in podcast form on most podcast platforms or as a web series on YouTube. Scooby and Shaggy were voiced by Scott Innes. Check out Scott's website, onescottshop.com. Scooby Addicts artwork by Will Davenport. Video editing by Nikki Blake. Music composed and performed by Bovine Nightmares. Please join us next time for another Scooby Panel.